أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت طيبين الطاحرين سيما الحجة بقية الله العظم روحي وأرواحنا له فداء ولعنوا دائم على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري وأسر لي أمري وحل أغدة من لساني يفقه قولي So the discussion is going to be about the hardships and how to deal with hardships So the first night we're going to talk a bit about the roots of hardships In other words the origins of hardships Why do, does hardships even exist? That's going to be the first night. So we're going to talk a bit about the wisdom behind hardships and why they exist. Tomorrow night, inshallah, we're going to talk about the different categories of hardships, where we're going to move on to how to deal with hardships in a logical way. And the third night, inshallah, our perception of the religion, how we can change our perception of the religion, which can help us deal with hardships in our lives. So that's going to be the discussion for the next three nights, inshallah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So a person could ask, why is it important for us even to understand hardships, the origins of hardships, the roots of hardships? Why is it even important for us to understand it? So the answer is quite simple. If we don't understand the origins of hardships, the roots of hardships, then we start believing that living a life without hardships is actually possible. If we don't understand that hardship is an essential part of our existence and our lives and this worldly life, we're going to think and assume wrongfully, of course, that a life without hardships is possible. How? One of the narratives that we are being fed with through social media, music, videos, movies, is a life without hardships is possible. You can attain it. How? What is it that people put up on their social media? Is, there pro is it their problems? No. No, it's the good things in life, right? They're out eating a nice dinner with their wife, for example, they take a nice selfie, that's what they put up. They don't put their problems up, right? So we start thinking and we being fed with all these positive things then we start thinking look these problems and issues in my life something is wrong with my marriage and we'll be fed with this narrative so we start comparing our lives to a fake standard that doesn't even exist and that's being fed even through media movies music whatever you can think of they're feeding us with this concept of a life without hardships exists out there and we can attain it. And if we don't have a life without hardship, that means that there's something wrong with us. Then a person who starts to think that his marriage is some, something wrong with his marriage. It, it's his wife that is the, the problem. His husband, her husband, for example, is the problem. They start thinking that children, for example, raising children is an issue. My children, my child is a loud child, for example. They start diagnosing the child as if it's a sick child because it's a bit active compared to the average child. Why? Because they start comparing their life to a fake standard that doesn't exist. One of my brothers from Denmark, may Allah prolong his life, he said something beautiful. He's a psychologist. So I sat down and talked with him. I was, I was like, I told him, if you want to share some experience with me, an experience that is the best experience that you can share with somebody, from your work as a psychologist. He says, Sheikh, you know what it is? Every person has hardships and difficulties in their lives. Old, young, poor, rich, doesn't make a difference. They have different hardships and difficulties and issues in their lives. He said, do you think that we have a, we have a hard life because we're refugees, our parents, they came from a country that were war-torn? I'm telling you, some of these millionaires' children, they're being molested since, since childhood. That's even worse than our lives coming as refugees, for example, in Denmark. Don't look at the apparent and think, no, you start comparing yourself to a fake standard that doesn't exist. That's why it's very important for us to understand the origins of, of hardships, the roots of hardships, 
then we, then we know that hardships is an essential part of this worldly life. You can't separate it. And the origins of hardships goes back to what? The limitations of this worldly life. In other words, every evil or hardship that you can think of goes back to something which is non-existent. In other words, limitations. Let me give you an example. Poverty. We say poverty is a hardship. But is poverty nothing but what? The lack of wealth. Being sick, for example, it's a lack of a good health. It's always the lack of something. Ignorance. We say ignorance is a hardship for some individuals, right? When they're being stupid. Well, what is it? What is ignorance in reality? It's a lack of knowledge, lack of insight. So it's an essential part of this world. Why? Because we live in a world of cause and effect. You can't separate limitation from this worldly life. You can't separate it. That's why you see Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, one of the companions, he came to him and he asked him, he said, when, and I'm going to be comfortable in my life, he said, I feel like every time I solve a problem, there's a new problem. Imam Jafar al he told him, the first day you enter paradise, you're going to be comfortable. Yeah? In other words, you're not going to be comfortable in this worldly life. It's full of limitations. In other words, there will be hardships. There will be hardships. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains in the Holy Quran, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr. Everything has a limitation in this worldly life. And these limitations are equal to hardships, issues, difficulties. But are they created without a wisdom? Is it like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He can create it better? No. There are certain wisdoms when it comes to hardships that we're going to talk about tonight. So we understand, look, hardships, they exist, is an essential part of our lives. You can't separate it. Let's get that clear first and foremost. Second, let's talk about how we deal with them in a logical way. Because when we understand the wisdom behind that hardships exist, then we can deal with them in a logical way. It will be easier for us to overcome the different hardships in life. So instead of using hardships to become an ungrateful person, you use it as a stepping stone for your own self-development. Yeah? The hardships becomes a what? A part of your self-development. How? We're going to explain it, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So, the first wisdom that exists when it comes to hardship, hardships, issues, and difficulties is that conflict is the law of progress. Conflict is the law of progress. If you want to have a healthy life, what should you do? You should stay away from certain things, yeah? You should work out. Sorry, but to work out, that's a hardship, right? It's a, diff it's a difficult thing compared to sleeping in the couch or laying down in the couch. It's a difficult thing, right? With every progress, every development, there will be some hardships involved with it. In other words, it's not something that you can't separate, you can't separate it, the, the two, two things. In other words, if you want to see some sort of a development or a progress, then you need to accept the hardships that comes with it. That's why you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He explains in the Holy Quran, He talks about individuals that will be tested. All the different examples He's talking about people would be tested with is something that goes back to what we told you, limitations, first thing. Second, when he wants to test them, he tests them with hardships. In other words, limitation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test you with something with fear. What does that mean to test you with fear? What is the opposite of fear? Being safe, right? So it's, again, it's a lack of safety. مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ And hunger. وَالنَّقُسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَأَنْفُسِ A loss of wealth and health. All of it are limitations. وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ But then he explains, give the glad tidings, good tidings to who? The people that are patient. Who are the people that are patient? Now he explains how people that can overcome hardships and how they can use it as a stepping stone for their own self-development from here on. He said, The verse that we normally recite when somebody passes away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about hardships. In other words, when they see hardships and when they're struck by tragedy, they say, we, to Allah we belong and to Him we return. In other words, they deal with hardships. They don't run away from them. 
They don't turn around, start comparing their lives to a fake standard that doesn't exist out there and think there's something wrong with my life. No, they deal with them in a logical way. They say from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we belong to Allah and to Him we return. In other words, we know there's limitation in this world, but we know they're temporary. We know they're not going to last forever. The only thing that's going to last forever is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he continues. Those are the people who upon them are the blessings and, and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the people that are guided, in other words. Who are the guided people? The people that deal with hardships in a logical way. So when they're struck by, with tragedy and hardships and calamities, they deal with them in a rational way. They say, to Allah we belong and to Him we return. Simple. Not the people that try to run away from these hardships. So the people that are guided up the people that what? Use hardships as a stepping stone for their own self-development. In other words, conflict is what? The law of progress. No conflict, no progress. There's not going to be any progress. If you want to develop, there was, you will see hardships. And this is not only when it comes to spiritual matters. Imagine one of the thing that, things that are mentioned in the Quran, which is one of the most difficult things to do as well. It's a salatul layl, for example. A simple action, but still it's difficult for us. Why? Because we, we love sleeping, right? Sometimes sleeping can be so comfortable for us, especially in the winter when it's cold outside. You don't want to get out of bed. But there's a self-development, there's an aspect where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants to raise you. He wants you to develop. He wants you to progress. And you can only do that through the different hardships and conflicts that exist in life. That's why you see, it's something that is consensus about amongst philosophers, Western and even Muslim philosophers, that every single progress is conditioned by some sort of a hardships and issues and calamities. You know the famous German philosopher Hegel, he mentioned attributes and characteristics originated and perfected in the battlefield of chaos and turmoil of the world. In other words, if you want to be perfected as an individual, if you want to see perfection, you have to put yourself under pressure. Or else you're not going to see it. Then you walk around think that you're a patient person. But if when you, you don't work with other people that put you under pressure, of course you're not going to find out whether you really are patient or not. But start to work with 20 other people and have a difference of opinion with these 20 different people. Let's see if you really are a patient person then. Yeah? When there's a difference of opinion. When they say something that goes against what you want, your own interest, your personal interest. Let's see if you're a patient person in this case. It's, it's easy to claim that you are a person with good akhlaq, for example, when you're not working with other individuals. For example, organization, work as an organization. But when you start working with different people, individuals, then you see, I don't have control over my anger. I'm impatient, for example. You find out all these things. Why? Because you're put into hardships. So it's hardships that actually makes us what? Develop. And we understand the flaws that we carry around in our hearts, the hidden flaws that are hidden even for ourselves. But when we are put under pressure, it all shows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains it in the Holy Quran in the most beautiful way in the verse that will recite it here إِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَ He never separates it He said with hardships comes ease Something that can't be separated these two If you want to be comfortable you need to have hardships in your life as well Self-development is conditioned by hardships That's it You can't change it And look he's talking to the most beloved creation Who is that? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Please recite the salawat and he states yeah. So if you come out of a set of a problems And there's some issues that you finish with Make sure to get up and strive again Don't give up Make sure to strive towards your Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So with hardship come ease and when you finish with those problems, make sure to find something new that you can strive for. Because you constantly are in, in movement. You can't stay, stand still. No, there's no such thing when it comes to self-development. Either you're working towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you 
being lead, led astray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because time is passing on whether you like it or not. We're in a world of movement. You can't change it. You can't just stop and be like, no, I'm not moving right now. No, that's not how it works. It's not up to you anymore. So if you're not working towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're being led astray. That's how simple it is. And with hardships, you can work towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is possible. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ It's a universal law. We created man in distress. You can't change it. So when we start accepting for ourselves that what? That it's a universal law first and foremost. And that conflict is the law of progress. If we want to see some sort of a self-development, we have to accept hardships. It's easier for us to overcome or at least to deal with hardships. There's a famous poet by the name of Sa'di Shirazi. Sa'di Shirazi, he's a famous Persian poet. He had a very difficult life. He's seen a lot of hardships in his life. He traveled a lot and he lost his family. Back then, traveling was a difficult task. It wasn't like... You just sit in an airplane, one hour later you're in Stockholm. No, it wasn't like that. Just to travel a few hundred kilometers, sometimes you have to travel for like, for days or sometimes weeks and months, right? So he traveled a lot in his life, even from Andalus, northern Africa, and he went uh, in Dam to Damascus from Andalus. That's a long way, right? By foot. So basically what happened, he went to Andalus, he went to Dimashq and he got married, he lost his child, he lost his family and everything. But look how beautiful his poetry becomes afterwards. In the beginning his poetry is very superficial. But after all the different hardships and the calamities he's seen in life, look how beautiful his poetry becomes. He said, let the short-sighted see comfort and the gnostic affliction. Yeah? If you're sh short-sighted, you know what it means? Yeah? Oh, you can't see, like, you, you don't have insight. You have difficulty in understanding f the future. You're short-sighted, in other words. Let them seek comfort because the Gnostic seeks affliction. The Gnostic is a arif, a person with true knowledge. For his ease is in tribulation. Why? Because his ease and comfort is in tribulation. Because of what? Because he knows that he's in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with, through these tribulations and difficulties and hardships, he's seeking towards his Lord. While the person who is short-sighted, he sits at home, be like, Alhamdulillah, God, he doesn't test me with anything. But he, don't, he doesn't know that he's being led astray, this individual. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't test him, it's because he's being left to himself. If you see two ch street children, or children in the streets, and one of them is, is a street child, Nobody's looking out for him. Nobody cares about him. And the other one is being restricted by his parents because they're loving and they care for the, for the child. Who is the most blessed child of these two individuals? There's no doubt about the individual that has his parents who restricts him because of the compassion and the love they have, they have for the child is much more blessed than the person that is being left to himself. Sa'di Shirazi is talking about these two individuals. He says, I'm the, I know that in hardships, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's caring about me. That's why I'm going through these hardships. Because I know hardships, what? It's the law of progress. If I want to see any development and progress, I need to under, accept these hardships and deal with them. Beautiful poetry. In a narration from Amir al-Mu'mineen, please recite the salawat. He explains, force yourself to acquire virtues because you have a natural propensity for vices. Yeah? He says, if you don't force yourself to attain virtues, if you don't force yourself to become a patient person, to become a humble person, to become a grateful person, if you don't force yourself into these things, then you have a natural propensity for what? Vices. In other words, to become a corrupt individual. Why? Because your natural instincts or your animal side, the animal instincts will take over if you don't force yourself into doing so. Amir al-Mu'mineen makes it clear the consequence of you not accepting hardships that are related to your own self-development, the consequences of that is going to be you're going to end up as a corrupt individual. In other words, if you're not willing to accept the hardships, 
accept the hardships with being a corrupt person. That's the consequence. It's a natural law. As we mentioned, limitations is a part of this material life. You can't separate it. So if you don't deal with them in a rational way, you will have to deal with them in a non-logical way, in other words. And the consequences of doing so is much worse than actually accepting the hardships that are related to your own self-development. Because when you use the hardships as a tool to, for your self-development, as a stepping stone for your own self-development, at least there will be a result of it. The consequences are going to be positive, right? But if not, you're going to be a lazy person. The person that accepts the hardships with working out, for example, is he in a better position than the person who is being lazy and have to face diseases in a few years? You can't even compare the two. A person who sits back, don't accept hardship or think that something is wrong with him because of the hardships, it's like that lazy person that have to deal with diseases and problems in the future. Why? Because he didn't want to accept the hardships that are related to actually working out, or eating healthy or staying away from certain types of food. That's how simple it is. And the same goes for our spiritual development. So that was the first wisdom behind it. We're going to mention four, inshallah, I'll keep the three last one a bit short so we can continue with the program. The second one is to separate the good from the evil. In other words, hardships and difficulties and calamities are there, exist to separate good from the evil. Sometimes it's among individuals, in other words, in a society, sometimes it's, it's within the heart of a believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions both examples in the Holy Quran, that sometimes He tests a group of people to separate the munafiqeen from the mu'mineen. We have a clear verse from that. And in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about, no, He said, no, it's not among people, it's what, what, what's in, within your heart. And He said, لِيُمَحِّسَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ in other words, he puts you in trial, he puts you in different hardships, so you can overcome these hardships. And all th these negative traits that you carry around within your hearts, this pollution that you have polluted your own heart with, your own soul with, to so clear your soul from these, this type of pollution. For example, sins and so on. Simple. It's to separate the good from the evil. Sometimes within your heart, sometimes in the society. To separate the hypoc hypocrites from the believers. The third one, awakening emotion. Some things, sometimes hardships and difficulties is what make, get, makes us get up out of bed. Sometimes we're in a state of completely, we are completely passive about our own lives. We don't take responsibility. That's why you see that in Denmark we had something that was very funny. They thought that the right, right wing, when they were becoming more, what is it called, more, uh, they become worse in their rhetoric when they're talking about Muslims. They thought that, oh, not, now not a, Muslim, a lot of Muslims, they're going to be assimilated. It had exactly this opposite effect. In other words, when Muslims they saw that laws were being passed against them. Schools were being shut down. Then you see suddenly you have Muslim deb deb debaters, you have Muslim people that want to start schools, you have Muslims that, that are coming to the masjid, they want to be active. Sometimes hardships and difficulties makes a person wake up from their sleep. That's why you see Shaykh Mutahiri Rahmatullah Ali. In a beautiful quote, he states, In a world formed by movement, opposition must predominate. Motion is not possible without the existence of obstacles. Motion is not possible without the existence of what? Obstacles. Motion is effort and struggling. So what creates awakening and motion in an individual? Sometimes it's hardships. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't think that every... Hardship or issue or calamity is a, is, a, is a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of youth, unfortunately, they have this mindset. Tomorrow we're going to talk a bit about it. No, it's how you deal with it. Sometimes poverty can be a reason for a man to enter paradise. Tell me, if that poverty is not a blessing for that individual, then what is? 
The opposite, we have a person, he's a millionaire, but he uses his wealth for corrupt purposes. Of course, that person, that's a, that's not a blessing for that person. That's a curse for that person to have this kind of amount of money. For something to be a blessing or a curse is, is something sometimes relevant, relative. It's how you deal with it as an individual. If you were in an accident, once there was a student, a uh, Hausa student, I remember this beautiful individual, how he dealt with some of the hardships in his life. Basically, he was in a car accident, so he became paralyzed from here, from the chest and down. So he was completely paralyzed sitting in a wheelchair. And I remember I was talking with him and, and I asked him about the hardships kind of like related to sitting in a wheelchair because I knew he was a, he was a believer and he could, he could take it like to talk about the issues and the, the, the difficulties that are related to being in a wheelchair. And I said, how do you deal with it? Like it must be di difficult. It's different from a person who, for example, if you were born in this way, it's, oh, you were used to it. It's not something... But if you're used to actually walking, running, you know, doing all sorts of activities and now you're stuck with a wheelchair, sometimes it's difficult for a person, mentally. So I asked him and said, Alhamdulillah, at least I'm breathing, am I? Yeah? Alhamdulillah, at least I'm breathing. Min min ibadiya shukur. There are few people that are really grateful. Really grateful. And that's the fourth and last one. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about appreciation in the Holy Quran, normally he relates it to some sort of a hardship or calamity. Prophet Ayyub السلام, after the disease, he turned around, he said, Arhamun Rahimin. The appreciation and the gratefulness he had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was even more after the hardships. He had a disease that people they didn't even want him in the city. Imagine having a disease where you smell so bad to an extent that people don't want you in the city. He's a prophet. But he turned the hardship around and became grateful. And he come, came out even stronger than before. When it comes to giving birth, everybody who, who's married, for example, now, who has children, they know how difficult it is, right? Giving birth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions something beautiful related to that in the Holy Quran. When he talks about parents, parents, he talks about the mother going all through all these hardships with giving birth to her child, and then he says afterwards, this dua should be recited afterwards. In other words, you should be you should appreciate the hardships that this person went through by giving birth to the, to this child. Hardships, gratefulness, in other words. Why? Because a person becomes truly grateful when, they, when they're faced with hardship, when they feel hardships, when they experience hardships in their life. Sometimes it's a, it's a reason for them to become grateful. But of course it depends on how you actually deal with it. That's why Shaykh Matahari Rahmatullah he said, unless a person goes to the depths of the valley, he doesn't perceive the might of the mountain. A beautiful poet. Yeah. If you don't go to the depths of the valley, if you don't see hardships, you don't understand the might of the the might of the mountain of which. Sometimes we, when we are deprived of something, we start appreciating it when we get it back, right? When we are sick, for example, we have a small flu, for example, not something seriously, but our whole body hurts, then we start appreciating our health, right? So when we are healthy, we start appreciating it. Of course, until five days have passed and we forget about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessed us with a, with a good health. And then we come, we neglect it again, unfortunately. You see, one of the great Western philosophers, when I say great, according to themselves, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, very famous. He has a book on child raising called Emile. In that book, he talks about children that haven't seen hardships and struggling and issues and calamities in their life. He talks about those children in particular. And he states, he said, ungratefulness is related to the lack of hardships in life. And then he explains, he said, a child that is born without any hardships, that are living in a house without any, seeing any hardships, any difficulties and any struggling, 
that child will be less grateful for the best food, for the best food, and will have less enjoyment and pleasure of eating that food than a village child that is eating dark bread, for example, in his village. He's going to have more pleasure and be more grateful about that small piece of bread that is dry compared to that person they've never seen struggling and hardships in their life. In other words, if you want to become truly grateful, use the different hardships in life to seek towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tonight's speech was about what? First and foremost, hardships is a universal law. You can't change it. Hardships will be an essential part of this material life, this worldly life, and you can't change it. We have to deal with them in a rational way. Why? Because there's limitations. And this worldly life is nothing but limitations. So you can't seek comfort. You need to deal with these hardships. So now when we understand we have to deal with these hardships, is there wisdom behind? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain why He created these limitations? Yeah, He does. The first and foremost is conflict is the law of progress. In other words, if you want to see a self-development, you need to face hardships the rational way, the logical way. So we have to feel, face hardship. Second, he wants to separate the evil from the good. In other words, he wants to clear our hearts from spiritual diseases and sometimes clear out the society from hypocrites. The third one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants us to be grateful. And that gratefulness is something that can be achieved and attained by what? By facing hardships the right way. And the fourth and the last one, is awakening emotion, which was the third one, but I mentioned it as the fourth one here. We can use it to become awakened and motion. When we talk about al Ba'in, we see that one of the individuals in Islamic history that went through a lot of hardships, which can't be denied, is nothing, nothing, no one but say the Zainab Salam Alaiha. Her life started with a tragedy, the loss of her mother, Salam Alaiha. A few years after the loss of her father, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam, she had to witness the shahada and martyrdom of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. And then it came to Imam Hassan salam and Imam Hussein salam. I don't know if you've been in Sham, if you've been in Syria before or not, but there's something which really struck me when I read the maqtal of Sayyidah Zainab Salaamu Alaihi and Sayyidah Ruqayyah. If you enter the old part of Damascus, from all the gates of the old part of Damascus to the grave of Sayyidah Ruqayyah Salaamu Alaihi is about 10-15 minute walk. If you walk fast, it's like 10-15 minutes. But in the Maqtal, it is described that these, uh, when the Ahlul Bayt Alayhi they came to Sham from the gate, the entrance to the grave of Sayyidah Ruqayyah Salaamu Alaihi they entered when the sun was rising and they came to Jama Umayyi, the masjid of Bani Umayya, when the sun was setting. In other words, for a whole day. All the tragedies that they faced in this period, I'm telling you, for ten, it only takes 10 minutes to walk that distance. And we know what they were being told when we read the maqtal of, of Sayyidah Ruqayya sallallahu alayhi wa She tells us what they've been telling her on the, on the way to the, to the masjid. What Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayhi wa had to go through. All of these hardships, all of these hardships. And one thing that is more beautiful than how they dealt with them was the perception of the different hardships sallallahu alayhi Umul Masaib, she knew who she was talking to when she said, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. After seeing the, the blessed hair of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam were being brought to them and say the Ruqayya salamu alayhi start crying and asked, and she told, told them to take the head towards the castle and don't bring it back because say the Ruqayya salamu alayhi couldn't take it anymore. But then Sayyidah Ruqayya Salaamu Alaihi she carried the head, she hugged the head in front of Sayyidah Zainab Salaamu Alaihi Sayyidah Zainab Salaamu Alaihi didn't say anything. 
And then she looked at the beautiful head. She said, who is it that made me an orphan at such a young age? Who is it who cut your throat, Ya Abba yeah. This small girl talking. And say to say to her, she said nothing. She couldn't say anything. It's her daughter, it's his daughter. What should she say? And then she saw that it went to an extent that she stopped crying severely until say the Ruqayya sallallahu she passed out. And this all she she left this world, she departed this world. The worst part of this incident is not when she talked about being an orphan. It was about when she wished for something which is not normal for a three-year-old child to be wishing for. She said, I wish I was blind when she saw the head of Abba Abdullah <laughs> A three-year-old child shouldn't be, shouldn't be wishing for that. They should be in the presence of their parents, feeling love and compassion from their parents. They should be wishing for to be blind. Ya yeah, Abba Abdullah and even worse than that was when they brought the hair to, to say the Ruqayya Salamu Alayha. The three year old daughter of Abu Abdullah couldn't even recognize the face of her own father from a close distance. Children, when they see their ch- parents from a long distance, they recognize their parents immediately. It doesn't take a long time for them to recognize their parents. But when she saw the face of Abu Abdullah, she couldn't even recognize it anymore. What have they done to your face, Ya Abba Abdullah since your old, three-year-old daughter can't even recognize it from a close distance? Even though they put the, his head on, in her lap, he, she couldn't even recognize it. She said, ma hada ras? Hada ras abik? They answered, Ala la'natullah ala qawmi dhalimeen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin. صلي على محمد وآل